Today on Public Research. The Israeli right has dominated Israel because my generation failed. My generation failed in doing what was necessary to move towards a political agreement. My generation failed by not pushing back against a very clear ideology. We failed because we were exhausted and we failed by passing the torch to the next generation. Did October 7th kill the last embers of hope for a two-state solution? We find out from one of the world's most undeterred proponents of the two-state solution, attorney and Jerusalem expert Daniel Seidemann, a longtime critic of Israel's occupation, who joins me to discuss Jerusalem, war in Gaza, the settlement enterprise in the West Bank, the delusions of the Israeli far right, and why Israel needs more tough love from its American friends. I can't imagine what it must be like to live in Jerusalem from a Chicago perspective with the amount of things going on from every direction. The protests, the Haredi draft law, what's just happened in Damascus, Gaza. What does it feel like to be on the ground right now in Jerusalem? I don't think there's one answer for that. You know, late, later this week, uh, there's going to be Leila al Qadr, which is uh, right the prayer right before the end of Ramadan. There are likely to be half a million people worshiping that night at Al Aqsa. None of my neighbors will know about it. None. <laughs> um, there were clashes between. Uh, Israeli reservists and ultra-Orthodox uh, two days ago. It's probably about 300 yards from Damascus Gate. And you think the people at Damascus Gate knew what was going on? No. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the same, you know, uh, the first day of Ramadan, there were very aggressive um, uh, body checks and harassment by the police. Gratefully, that didn't hold. Do Israelis know about that? No, no. There are mass demonstrations. Uh, and the mass demonstrations <clears throat> are at the center of town. They're <clears throat> uh, near the one of the prime minister's six homes uh, and in, near the government headquarters in the Supreme Court. That's felt if there's a traffic jam. It's felt by the couple hundred thousand people who are there but people can pretty much lead parallel lives in the city, even when they're in close geographical contact. Now, there is something that's shared very differently, um, but on, on both sides of town. And one is, I would say, a very uh, subdued or almost distinguished mood in each city the pall of the war and of the events that took place uh, on October 7th on the Israeli side, the hostages, of course, and on the Palestinian side. Um, 400,000 Palestinians in East Jerusalem and you know almost all of them have relations in Gaza. Um, and being in touch with the Palestinian side closely uh, and being an Israeli and being in touch with the Israeli side, uh, neither side understands what the other is experiencing. So it, it's a complex picture. But my initial response is, I've been to Chicago. You know, uh, it's just as normal to the extent that you call normal Chicago normal. Well, that's not quite the case. But Chicago has its abnormalities, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Um, how scared are you about what the response might be to the uh, Israeli Air Force actions in Damascus? This is the kind of thing where you get up in the morning and you say, what's going to go wrong today? Now, I do that for a living. 
because I monitor things in Jerusalem and it's my job as I define it to myself to scan the horizon and say, what the hell is going to blow up in Jerusalem today? Because sometimes it does. Not often, but it does. Um, we're living at the moment with frayed nerves. Uh, and we follow these events. I say we, Israel as, as, as a group, um, about things that could make the situation worse. Um, and there are those who are supporting a military campaign in the north with Hezbollah, because there are 100,000 Israelis who have been evacuated from their homes and there's no immediate prospect of their going back. And there are many Israelis who live with uh, the trepidation of a two-front war. Um, and the international community correctly is thinking about the prospect of a regional war. When I talk to certain folks, the atmosphere is one of Cuban missile crisis. This could become very bad very quickly. Um, and uh, it, it would be folly to hazard a, a guess. My, my uh, expertise is Jerusalem. I try to stay in my lane. Uh, but my Jerusalem experience tells me that um, incendiary events are contained when people don't want to go to war. And when people do want to go to war, you don't need an incendiary you know, a, a event except as a pretext. But I would not dare apply that in this context. Um. What if you had to put a percentage on the chance that this Haredi um, ruling from the Israeli Supreme Court could topple the current Israeli government in the next two to three months? What percentage would you pick? Uh, that's one of the things that I I wouldn't float, you know bet about. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've said that Netanyahu's days are numbered and he's going to bury all of us, literally and figuratively. Um, it's certainly a threat. I do believe that Netanyahu will not be able to last very long. Now, that very long could be days, weeks, or it could be several months. I don't think it will be more than that. For the simple reason is that he no longer enjoys the trust of a majority of Israeli citizens. Not only that, the Israeli citizens who keep the society afloat don't trust him. Uh, because of the war that has been muted and reserved, but because the war is going on and it is apparent that it is being artificially prolonged by Netanyahu for his own purposes and jeopardizing the lives of the hostages, it's now out in the street. Uh, one of the commentators um, and described what happened last week is that Israeli society has moved from despondency to rage. And there's a lot of rage. Now, how this scenario plays out, I don't know. I do not believe that you can govern a country in crisis when nobody trusts you and nobody trusts Netanyahu. I, I know you're not a military expert, and I know you want you like to stick to your expertise, but I do have to ask, um, I Obviously, as I said, I'm not a military expert, but I believe one of the principles of uh, conducting war is you cut off the enemy's supply lines, right? It's been it's going to be seven months. The Rafa tunnels have not been touched. Some people even speculate Sinwar, perhaps some of the hostages are not technically under Gaza anymore. Um, do you think that was a mistake? Not sort of sealing any potential tunnels early on. I pass on that. I really don't. <laughs> I know. respect that. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I just remember, this is probably 20 years ago, uh, the United States government has not had officials in Gaza since 2003. 
when an American convoy was attacked. But this is somebody working for an aid organization who proudly showed me a picture of his huge Harley Davidson that had been smuggled in in the tunnels. I began to look at tunnels differently since then, but that's anecdotal. I have no idea. Uh, I would have a better idea if there were clearly defined goals for this war, and there are not. But even then, uh, I would not hazard a, a guess. I defer to the military experts. So I really I feel indebted to you, and I'll tell you why. When October 7th happened, I actually left for a trip to Canada, road trip. So I had all this time in the car. And so I listened to all the news I could get about Israel in, I don't, unfortunately, I, I went to Hebrew school, but I didn't learn Hebrew. Unfortunately, many of us did. <laughs> <laughs> so I listened, I was listening to everything and everything was so bleak, but the only positive thing basically I listened to for those weeks was that gave me a lot of hope, honestly, was your appearance on Robert Wright's uh, blogging head show. And I wanted to play the the part that gave me such hope. And the question I have in mind is about where Israeli politics is going. So I'm going to play a clip of you and then a clip of another Israeli, and then we'll discuss. Good. The two-state solution could be, might be dead. I know the details, but it's dead because it was killed. The one-state solution was always a fairy tale. That which was killed can be resurrected. This town has a bit of experience with resurrection of the dead, as you might recall. Um, I think people are now uh, realizing we can't continue, and the only way that this can happen is by means of proceeding to a two-state solution. Now, I don't believe that it is immediately possible, uh, but I, I can tell you a month ago, I said, I still believe that it's the only solution. I think it's inevitable. I don't think I'll live to see it. I no longer say that. I think that one of the achievable results of this horrible war could be a resumption of a political process, perhaps long, but the North Star will be, a viable independent Palestinian state, because failing that, we will just revisit this until we collapse. Okay, let me, uh... I can't help but think. Now, this is a clip from a podcast called Two Nice Jewish Boys. I think one thing during this conversation and relating to the war, and how, you know, in the end of the day, people like Smoltich and ben Gvir, you know, they stuck to their ideology even though every day the incitement, you know, and the hate and the fear of them in the mainstream media, in in the social media, in the left, in the high society of Tel Aviv, in the culture scene, uh, it's endless. They stuck to their truth. And now, you know, when you hear in live TV, in t t Channel 12, a blonde Ashkenazi girl from one of the kibbutzim of Otef Aza, who says, when I get back, I want to see uh, the sea view from my kibbutz, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Gaza should be wiped out Hiroshima style, right? What she says basically is Kahana was right. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people now in the left and in the right say, we, there are no innocent people in Gaza, then I can't help but think, um, you know, they stuck to their ideology and, and, and and all Israeli society is now shifting to their position. So what do you make of that? So I would love your reaction. Could you, could you tell me who it was I was watching? Uh, those two, uh, they host a podcast called Two Nice Jewish Boys. And one host is well, named... I have a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> and one of their names is Eitan Weinstein. And then I'm blanking on the other one's name. Okay, you know, one of the lessons I believe of this war is what was, isn't, and will not be. Avoid linear thinking. Do not assume that things will work that the way they worked in the past. Now, obviously the laws of gravity and all sorts of constants will remain. There was an excellent article by Bill Burns, the head of the CAA, on 
definitive events, pivotal uh, epical events, uh, and we're in the midst of one. And the day after the ceasefire, we're going to be confronting a different reality. Part of that reality is going to be something of a lunar landscape with flat, with no landmarks, disorientation. Um, I think it's a mistake to speak about you know, a, a short term uh, electoral polling and things of that nature um, because of a number of assumptions that I have. Uh, number one, this war has killed off a generation of Israeli leadership. One of the reasons that keeps Netanyahu's government together is the fact that they all know that this is the last time they'll be seeing the Knesset from the inside. Uh, curb your enthusiasm. I think that much of the same applies to the opposition, which barely exists. I can tell you about three or four Knesset members who are prominent and they're from different places, but uh, Israel has been leaderless in terms of the formal political echelons. Um, there is a general sense that Israel has to reboot. The Israeli public has reinvented itself twice since January of last uh, year and the day after the um, ceasefire. There will be a third reinvention. And I'm not saying something that is not commonly discussed. This is commonly discussed among Israelis. The first reinvention was when we stopped the judicial coup, which apparently we, we succeeded in a remarkable display about the um, healthy engagement of the Israeli public for the first time in years. You know, it's the, the United States is often described as a sleeping giant that moves slowly but provoke it. And you, when you incur it, it rises up. Well, the Israeli people have risen up. The second time has been during the war itself, when it turns out that the um, organs of the Israeli government, the, the ministries, uh, the, the those uh, bodies that were to provide services were gutted. They were hollow. They were a Potomkin village because of Netanyahu's ideology. But Israel continued to function. How did it continue to function? Because the citizenry rose up and fulfilled the the role of government. And when I say the citizenry, I am talking about. Uh, Arab and Jew and ultra-Orthodox. And the sense is, um, to quote a few people, hostages coming back, I want my country back. And uh, that's not only an accusation uh, against Hamas. Um, there was a woman who came out of um, uh, captivity in uh, Gaza and reported poked the microphone in her face and said, what are your plans? Which is about as tasteless a question as you can ask. And she calmly responded, I need to recuperate. I want to be with my loved ones. And then we go back to work. What does it mean in go back to work? We have a country to refound. Now, I believe that we are going to be witnessing a new leadership in Israel, not completely new, and don't ask me who they are. I have a number of candidates, and most of them are reluctant, and many of them would say never, and will be there. Add to that, I do agree that one of the major outcomes of this war is a total loss of faith in Palestinians, in political processes, the Israeli uh, public has lurched to the right. But I think it's lurched to the right in different ways, and I don't know how hard that is. Because there's also a light motif of those who saying, you know, for everyone who says, you're never going to have peace with these Palestinians. Others are saying, we are paying the price for ignoring this. Uh, we, we cannot ignore the Palestinian problem. And Netanyahu's strategy was contain the conflict. We can handle that. That's been proven wrong. I think that more than left or right, because these things are malleable, uh, they're more malleable than usual. 
what both publics are going to be confronting uh, the day after the war is trauma and a very deep trauma. This was uh, perceived, it's a bit hyperbolic, but not entirely, absolutely, almost like a near-death experience. Um, uh, and disorientation. We don't know how the world works anymore. Um, you know, we went to sleep uh, on October 6th, knowing that Israel's place was secure in the world. And now we found ourselves in the maelstrom in a clash of an armed clash of civilizations. So we will be searching for our way. I can guarantee you one thing. It will not be the same. It will be different. It will be a different Israeli society. And I think that's a, an opportunity to be seized. Uh, not for short-term political gain, but in order to reshape the strategy of Israel of how to maintain the viability of the Third Jewish Commonwealth. I, I this is a blunt question, but there's no other way to put it because I'm I hear it every day, constantly stated as fact. So I'll just ask: Is Israel committing genocide right now? I'll give you a long answer. OK, uh, and I've said this from day one. Israel had to respond and respond brutally to the events of October 7th. Uh, Israel could not respond with a local um, um, laser um, honed operation for all sorts of reasons. So a strong response was inevitable and I think appropriate. In addition to that, there is no military response, however surgical, that does not involve civilian casualties. That is the nature of Gaza. And in some ways, it's the nature of Gaza as Hamas has planned it. There is merit to the argument that civilians are used to protect military targets. But on that first day, I said, wiping out Gaza, which is clearly in our power, is a war crime. And somewhere between doing nothing or having a surgical strike and, go, and going home, in the mass annihilation, there is a proportional response. Don't ask me what that proportional response is. I don't know. I do know people, uh, family members, whose position in the army is to decide micro. Uh, is this an attack that we can carry out given the current circumstances. There is no clear answer. But what I can tell you is that the Israeli response goes well beyond any reasonable interpretation of a proportional response, well beyond. Um, and I, I come to this conclusion reluctantly I come to the conclusion where I treat everything that I hear from Gaza from anybody with great skepticism, because that's what Jerusalem has taught me to be. Just be, you know, show show me show me the facts. Um, there have been war crimes committed. Um, do I rely on my government to investigate them? A little bit more in the past, not not because we have been transformed, but because. The, the fear of the International Criminal Court is there. It's there. Uh, does it go as far as your question? Is this genocide? I don't believe it is. Because um, for the overwhelming majority of Israelis and, in, and, and those in power, it is not the intent to wipe out the Palestinians. 
there are ministers in this government that I wouldn't say that is the case about them, but they're not making the decisions. So it's not a, you know, a spurious um, question. Um, but there is a dismissiveness of the value of innocent Palestinian lives that leads to results that are reminiscent of genocide. I was debating a uh, anti-Zionist uh, last week, and we were discussing this question, and I asked him why he thought the IDF made all these uh, phone calls, which apparently they do, I don't know if every time, but sometimes when they bomb, they'll call people in the area supposedly and tell them to evacuate. And he said to me, they just do that for cover. It's just they it's they're just trying to throw people off what would you what would your response be i think you'd have to look at every case um there you know i know that there are people in positions of authority in throughout the idf who are in part of the process of deciding uh, about the whether to open fire and who asked the questions, what would I be deciding if, if those were Israeli kids? They exist. I'm not sure they're, they're not a majority, but they exist. There are those who say the world is watching. Uh, this podcast is being recorded uh, hours after, I believe it's now seven aid workers uh, were killed in Gaza. Uh, I'm sure they're not the first aid workers, but this is one of those moments that defines the conflict. Uh, and it will have an impact. It is less likely that Israel go into Rafa now than it was 12 hours ago because of those seven individuals, even though we have had thousands of casualties since then. And there are those who go through the motions as you were told by your uh, interlocutor, this is just for um, sake of show. And there are those who delight in it. Uh, there is an element of bloodlust and vengefulness uh, uh, among Israelis. Um, I don't think it dominates our policies, but it does. All of this does add up to a dismissiveness. It. You know, for me, a lot of this comes from occupation, Israeli occupation, and what it does to the psyche, what it does to the soul. And at the heart of occupation is the diminished humanity of the occupied. And when over 57 years you get used to the diminished uh, humanity of the occupied, it's easier to come dismissive. But there are folks who are not. Mm. I I consider myself part of the left in America. Um, I'm going to be voting for Biden, of course. Um, and so as a younger person, I wanted to show you sort of what is becoming the doctrinaire position on Israel. This is from a show called Left Reckoning. Now, in all of this fucking window dressing, well, I don't like the right wing in Israel. I would like it if the left came back to power in Israel. The left doesn't exist in Israel because Israel is a settler colonial state that is that is obsessively pursuing a goal of eradicating Palestinians, eradicating Palestinians um, and, 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 and denying them human rights within Israel um, and then denying them the very right to life in Gaza and in the West Bank. That is what the reality of the Israeli government is because it can never um, do what needs to be done, which is to pursue a one state solution with equal rights for people regardless of their ethnicity or religion. Wow, what a fucking liberal concept, by the way. Uh, a democracy where people have equal rights and equal vote, that should be the kind of shit that liberals like fucking Pac-Man are able to uphold. But no, we're gonna make an exception for this ethno state, and we're gonna cry and whine about the consequences of our support for that. Give me a fucking break. I'll just stop it there. Um... Can I give him a fucking break, please? <laughs> um, I mean, personally, it bothers me that those two guys are uh, not 
not they're not Arab, they're not Muslim, they're not Palestinian, they're not Jewish, and they they sort of there seems to be an arrogance. You need to do this immediately. But anyways, uh, I'm very curious for your reaction. Well, you just reminded me of something. One of one of the leaders of the, of the progressive camp on these issues is a wonderful guy by the name Matt Duss. Um, and and I know Matt very well. And Matt will say, you know, we progressives. And I say, Matt, I'm not sure I'm a progressive. You're a progressive, Matt. I'm not sure you're a progressive. So if I've been appointed a progressive by Matt Duss, thank you, Matt. Um, I could take issue with all sorts of things, including the dismissiveness of the Israeli left. I'm just going to get rid of that. The Israeli right has dominated Israel because my generation failed. My generation failed in doing what was necessary to move towards a political agreement. My generation failed by not pushing back against a very clear ideology. We failed because we were exhausted and we failed by passing the torch to the next generation. I think that that's changing. I hope it will change. Uh, <clears throat> but it's easy to blame the messianic right for all of this. Um, it's important to recognize our own role in this. Now, as to the one state, two state, red state, blue state, Dr. Seuss thing, it just, it, it annoys me no end. Um, I'm described <clears throat> as an expert on Jerusalem. There is no such thing as an expert on Jerusalem. There are experts on Mameluk pottery and Byzantine churches and uh, the structure of Ottoman government in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's too infinite to be known, but I do have an expertise. And my expertise is the mechanics of operation of occupation in East Jerusalem. That's what I know. What makes it run? What slows it down? What makes it break down? What's its goal? You have an occupation that breaks down, bring it into my shop. I'll know how to fix it, okay? My goal is not peace. Peace is derivative. My goal is ending occupation in a way that is compatible with the national interests of both sides. That's difficult, it is not impossible. And occupation ends in one way, not one and a half, not one and three quarters, not two, not three. One way, it ends in a border. And this is the conversation that I have with young Palestinian friends who are a source of great hope for me because they're amazing. And we have people that we can work with. And it's a shame that they're not known enough. And they are, I would say, Post two staters, you know, we, we don't care whether it's one state, two state, as long as we have our liberty. And I say, okay, show me a trajectory whereby you arrive at one state. I can show you a very difficult trajectory path, how two states can happen. And it's hard work and it'll take time, but it is doable. Now the two state solution may be dead but if it's dead, it's because of the necessity of uprooting 200,000 out of a half a million settlers. That which was dead can be resurrected. The one state solution is dead because it never existed except you know, as a unicorn in a kid's coloring book. Now that may sound strange to you because I spend almost as much time in East Jerusalem as I do in the West. I feel comfortable. I consider myself closer in many ways to young Palestinian kids on the other side of town, to you know all sorts of husbaristas in the United States. 
when I say we with them, it, it just resonates more soundly. I have no problem at all in living in one state. You know, I, I consider myself a political two-stater, a cultural one-stater, and a culinary Palestinian. Okay. Is it possible? I think one state's possible. 20, 30, 40 years after the border. Because it will, there's no way of leaping from here to there. The day the border goes up, and one day it will go up, and in many ways it's already there, that border will begin to unravel, and life will take over, and, and events will not be dictated by ideologues, but life will be dictated by mortal men and women. And the Jerusalem as a city will heal much more quickly than people expect. So if you say to me one state, sure, but there is no way of ending occupation without a border. And there's no one state without peace. And peace is the derivative of the ending occupation. Peace is not the immediate objective. It derives on the existential imperative for Israelis and Palestinians and occupation. The day that happens, we can start working for peace. Do you mind if I ask you about the details of a two-state solution? <laughs> sure. Okay. No, so, I, I'm going to... Uh, so I, I I I could ask a bunch of questions, but I think the most efficient thing would be to just uh, screen share Elliot Abrams making a short case for why you're wrong. Um, I haven't seen Elliot for a long time. Thank you. <laughs> um, why won't it work? I'll just try to be very brief. Um, first. Doing this right now, pushing for this right now, demanding it right now, is the greatest reward for terrorism I think any of us have ever seen. Because what changed is October 7th. Second, the, the arguments about how it won't be a threat to Israeli security because it'll be demilitarized don't pass the laugh test. It, it is a good analogy to think about the Versailles Treaty, the stab in the back legend, the Rhineland, who is going to enforce this demilitarization? Um, nobody's going to do it except the Israelis, except now you have a Palestinian state. So what they're doing in the West Bank on a daily basis becomes an act of war across an international boundary. And there are so many details to go through about that, um, about who, they, who the Palestinian state could have a, uh, an alliance with. Who could open an embassy? Would Iran be able to open an embassy? If the answer is yes, and what do you think is going to be in those sealed diplomatic pouches, which can, by the way, not just be envelopes, they can be trucks. So it, the demilitarization part um, really does not make sense. And then, of course, to finish, there are some minor details that have not yet been ironed out. Jerusalem. You're going to divide Jerusalem again? You're going to get the Israeli electorate to agree in the aftermath of October, I mean, this is not serious. This is, this is what you say when you haven't thought about this and you have no solution uh, and you want to look good to European diplomats and leftist American voters. So uh, on top of that, why not to just simply say? And just to be fair, I put this small clip of David Wormser at the end, sorry. It's things, it's Israel you do, Israel you must do, Israel you must do. It's things that even a year ago should never have been asked. And we now, after October 7th, he's talking about the Biden administration asking know how deadly it would have been had Israel given in. Imagine for a second if there were a Palestinian state on October 7th with Tulkarim and Kalkilia being under Hamas control right next to the northern approaches to Tel Aviv and Israel's narrow waist. Uh, it's really a question whether Israel could have survived the Palestinian state instead of returning and treating Israel as an ally and saying, well, you took a lot of hits and your hits were just taken because you have spent the last 30 years conceding to Western expectations. And now we always said, take risks. We're going to have your back if you take risks. Well, the risks have turned south. Israel's now facing a lot of...
I, I would I would disagree with his contention that Israel has taken a lot of risks uh, for peace uh, over the last 30 years. But the general arguments of those two, what, what would your response be? First of all, <clears throat> uh, I've met both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were in positions of authority, when Elliot Abrams was in the White House and I took him around East Jerusalem, and um, uh, with Mr. Worms when he was, I believe, an advisor to Vice President Cheney. Uh, they may attribute what they're saying to October 7th. What they're saying now is no different than what they said in 2003 and 2004. So, um, by the way, we all maintain certain loyalties to our autobiography. Number one, if anything, the lesson of this war should be that Netanyahu's doctrine that you can contain the problem, you can manage the problem uh, in perpetuity, that you can avoid negotiating with the Palestinian Authority whose security forces cooperate in an exemplary fashion with the IDF and our security services. And you can do that by placating and um, uh, uh, bribing Gaza. That has been proven to be an illusion. I don't want to be unkind to Netanyahu, even though it's always tempting to be unkind to Netanyahu, what he believed, much of the rest of the world believed. E the EU member states, and God bless them, the US administrations, you're not going to get peace with these guys. Come on, you know, Netanyahu, Abbas, forget it. Let's put this on the back burner. You know, just, you know, deprioritize it. There has not been a political process since Ulmer in 2008. And that is a major contributory factor to the state in which we find ourselves. Um, during, during Obama's administration, with Secretary Kerry, there was an American general, General Allen, who was detailed, worked out with the Israeli security establishment. What will make the two-state solution acceptable for you as military people? And he put together a package that satisfied them. So when in the past, I would be asked, uh, how do you deal with security? I would say, as you did, I'm not a security expert. I defer to these experts. That doesn't work because something did happen on October 7th. It's not only it's a deep trauma and psychological problem, but it is also a real problem. And that is, how can we guarantee, and not only militarily, how can we guarantee that the circumstances that were created October 7th never happen again? And I cannot see, I can tell you, if we perpetuate occupation, October 7th will repeat itself. Israel will end occupation, or occupation will be the end of us. And nothing in October 7th has changed that. If light in Gaza will be hell, even if some of that hell or much of that hell is self-imposed, life will never be paradise in Israel. That means that we it is an existential imperative for both peoples to move in a very sober, cautious way. And the general Allen is not him. Uh, in particular, owe the respective publics. You know, 
Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank are saying, why should we want peace if, if they, they can do this to us? You have two traumatized people and both deserve answers. Both sides deserve answers. And they're not easy, which means, no, we will not be going directly to a permanent status agreement. Neither Israelis nor Palestinians have been blessed with Scandinavian temperaments. But we have to know what the North Star is. And the North Star is ending occupation by means of a border. And nothing in October 7th has changed that. Yeah, I, I often hear Israelis say, oh, we can't have a two-state solution. Look at how much the West Bank supports Hamas. And my response when I hear that is, well, put yourself in their shoes. They've watched the settlements expand and expand and eat up what was supposed to be their future state. And it sort of humiliates Abbas, makes him look like a clown. And then they see Hamas is, well, at least they take action. Um, is there, how much awareness of that, uh, of how they, of what might explain those numbers is there in Israel? It, it, it's, it's easy for white, privileged, Ashkenazi Jews like myself to um, you know, uh, comment on just how much Hamas is in power. There's one way of finding out called elections. <laughs> the last thing was elections in 2006. Um, and we will only know when there are elections. Uh, and nobody's talking elections. I think that's a mistake. Even though I understand the reservations, there's not going to be a credible political process without a credible prison, uh, uh, government in Ramallah. And the Palestinian people believe in Abbas as much as the Israeli people believe in, in Netanyahu. Um, there, is, there are distinctions that have to be made. Uh, what I hear from my friends um, in their 20s and 30s who are active in Palestinian social media, that there is wall-to-wall -wall sympathy with Hamas. That among a very large group, there's a discomfort over the slaughter of October 7th. Amongst others, there's a denial it ever took place. There is zero identification with Israel. And these are people, 400,000, 40% of the city in which I live. Now compare that to the Palestinian citizens of Israel who have displayed unprecedented identification and solidarity with Israeli society. Not easy, not simple, but it's palpable. It's there. Um, they perceived that October 7th was directed against them as well. Now, if you go back to 1948, the folks living in Shvaram in Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, and those in East Jerusalem were brother and sister. And for me, um, perhaps simplistically, I learned that the position of Palestinian citizens of Israel, of Israeli Arabs, with all of its problems and discrimination and violence and murder, et cetera, has been a huge success. Uh, and Israeli democracy has proven to be more feisty than what we thought. Israeli occupation has been a total failure we maintain a strategy that we developed in 1967. Buy them and break them. We will placate them with crumbs off of the table for material benefits, and we will break their, you know what? Uh, you know, you want a driver's license? Go see Captain George. 
that works, buying and breaking. That works until one day it's October 7th. It doesn't work. Are you aware that Jonathan Pollard has started a podcast? You know, I saw something along those lines and, you know, my response was not shock. Well, in a world of Trump uh, and Netanyahu uh, and Elon Musk, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Pollard becoming something of a cultural hero in certain quarters makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> Did he? I uh, have you seen the Israeli SNL? I forget the name of the show. They're without without the world song. Um, go look at my Twitter feed. It's, oh. it's super. It's yeah. super. But on my Twitter feed, uh, I recalled that there was another version, satirical version of this, um, made in 1985, and I've posted it on social media, uh, where there was only one actor uh, who did amazing interpretations impersonation of, of people renowned for it. He's still around, Tuviet Safir. And it was Rabin. And it was David Levy. And it was Shamir. And it was uh, Avram Shapira. Same song. But, and, you know, I looked at that. Um, there were like six personalities. Uh, all of them were gone except for David Levy. Um, and it's another Israel. Tufia Safir is also still around, but it's interesting. It's also a great piece of work I, to compare the two. I ask that because, and I want to ask about um, delusions on the far right in Israel. And so I think, um, you know, the, the song basically was about how uh, sort of the Israeli right it's like, we can do it without America, without any allies and the sort of delusional belief. Mm -hmm. So um, I pay attention to Jonathan Pollard like I do Caroline Glick so I can understand what the right in Israel is thinking. Um, when The Economist did their Israel Alone cover, this was Jonathan Pollard's reaction. Yes. It's trundling towards Auschwitz that were composed of leftists, uh, Bundes, uh, Beitaris, whatever, it was everybody. We're in the same boat here. And we have only one great protector, God. And he's the one keeping that flag up. Because as, as long as we embrace him and embrace Torah virtue and, and philosophy, the wind can blow as hard as it can. And we will still stand firm, ourselves alone, dot, 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 with God. So I wasn't scared by that at all. It, is, it is precisely. I, I, I accidentally played the wrong clip, but he basically starts crying and talking about how he's going to frame the Economist cover because he thinks it's so beautiful. The, the Actually, the title of that video is hilariously Pollard Alone, Israel Alone. But I think we yeah. can expect no less from somebody who betrayed the country of his birth, treason, sat in prison, deserved to sit in prison, whose actions cost lives of Americans and friends of America for him to say, we don't need America. It fits like a glove. I, my larger question was, and I, I've tr been trying to understand the Israeli far right, so I've been actually been listening to Moshe Faglin, because he's just sort of, there's something about him that's very e evil and interesting. Uh, he's such a bizarre figure. And for instance, I, I heard him say that the borders of Israel are the Nile and the Euphrates. And what I'm getting at is when I listen to the Israeli far right, I see delusions, like serious delusional thinking. Do you also see that? No, uh, yeah. well, let, let, let's be fair. Um there's right and there is the messianic right. Um, you know, Nelson Rockefeller was to the right of center, but that's he's not exactly representative of the American right today. 
uh, and there are sober voices on the Israeli right, and there are worthy interlocutors. Uh, but policy is driven in the Netanyahu government by um, those who are the extreme wing of the messianic Jews who attribute cosmic uh, significance to the existence of the state, continuity with the uh, um, Second Temple period, uh, the goal of recreating biblical Israel at um, as in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, that this land is exclusively ours and who needs the United States. That is clearly delusional. Now, in the past, Netanyahu coddled these people, but his view was more Hobbesian. Life is one of eternal struggle and only the strongest um, uh, survive. Uh, he did that in a way that was risk averse. So I would distinguish between Netanyahu, who I thought was a disaster for Israel way long time ago, but for not for those reasons. You know, one of the things that I have been dealing with for the last 30 years is uh, the biblically motivated settlements in East Jerusalem. And for years, I found myself saying they're becoming more powerful and reshaping the character of Jerusalem. And when Trump and Netanyahu were in power simultaneously, they weren't becoming more powerful. They were the power. Now, I can think of two people, um, I can think of no two people who are less men of faith than Trump and Netanyahu, regardless of how many Bibles Trump sells. Men of faith, they are not. But policy in Washington was driven by the faith of end of days evangelicals. Policy in Jerusalem was and continues to be driven by messianic uh, ultranationalist Jews. Um, and I believe that this development had more than a marginal impact on creating the dynamics that led to the war in Gaza. You want a religious war? Here's your religious war. Uh, the two nice Jewish boys, or the, the that's the name of them, Pollard and Moshe Faglin, I've listened to all of them call for bas basically ethnically cleansing Gaza. And they just mm -hmm. say, they don't say I'll give them this. Well, I think Faglin does sort of, kind of don't, they'll say just move them into Egypt, take mm -hmm. them to Europe. Yeah. I find it chilling um, to hear that. How large of it, it, is that view in Israel? I don't want to hazard a guess. Right. Um, what I do know, it is being carried out on a piecemeal basis in the West Bank under the cloud the, in the fog of war where Palestinian villages and Palestinian villagers are being driven off their land and the army is not intervening. Um, I say with total authority that there are those prominent in the ultra-nationalist Israeli right who welcome this war as an opportunity, and an opportunity that will not happen again, and we have to take advantage of it. So would they you know, avoid a larger war? No, they'd likely welcome a larger war because it would you know, expand the range of their opportunities. It seems like there are two groups that actually want a one state. There's people like Elon Pape and Avi Schleim at Oxford. But actually, isn't it the case that these Smotrich also wants a, a, a one state of his own? What is this vision of this annexing? And what is this plan that they're trying to do? I certainly would not you know, uh, uh, equate the two. I think that those who uh, advocate uh, a one state 
are completely misled and live in a world that I don't live in, but they are decent people and uh, well motivated and they're worthy interlocutors. Uh, for the settlers, it basically means uh, those who oppose the legitimacy of exclusive Israeli sovereignty over all of the land of Israel will not be allowed to remain here. Those who are willing to serve as extras in our biblical extravaganza and accept their status as a barely tolerated minority under our watchful eye can stay. That will be enshrined in law, and that will turn Israel, the one state, into an apartheid state, and there are manifestations of that happening already. You are a very wise, I think, and much less reactive than I am. For instance, I don't know if you saw, there was a protest outside a Biden fundraiser, it's a, a pro-ceasefire, anti-Israel protest. There was a clip of of some of the protesters calling a woman the I'll call it the K word, right? Mm -hmm. I think you know what I'm referring to. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's I, been hurled at me a couple of times yeah. recently. Yeah. I I'm sort of uh, I guess a lower evolved person where I I fall into the trap of judging that movement by these things, and I think you know what all these anti semites are in the movement. I'll stand with the Israelis, but I think, and there's a name for that called nut picking, where you take the worst of a group and then you it's a cycle. You seem extremely good at raising yourself above the fray. How do you, when you look at stuff like that, how do you rise above that kind of reaction? I've had a great teacher, Jerusalem. Hmm. Um, and when you live Jerusalem, the real Jerusalem, all of a sudden you understand that there are times when you say the word we, it's me and my Palestinian neighbor. And it's not an ideology. I have worked with some of these people for 30 years. It's not people to people. It's not touchy-feely. It's not religious dialogue. Um, and when uh, there is an attack uh, uh, on Palestinians, they're hurting not only my friends, but my compatriots in Jerusalem. I take that personally. But when the Palestinian cause is tainted by anti-Semitism and by proto-fascism and by stupid hyperbole, I am angry at that, among else, because they are doing a great disservice to the people that they pretend to represent. My friends never speak that way. How do you know everybody? Like, you know, you've met, it seems like you know everybody, like, um, you, you've met David Cameron, right? Uh, have you met Jared Kushner? No, no, okay. I have not. Okay. That, you know, but I do. I have visited the courtyard uh, that is named after him in the American Embassy <laughs> around the corner from my house. So I pay homage on occasion. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm curious. Why did McCain, Lindsey Graham, and John Barroso pick you, the this lefty guy, to give a tour of Jerusalem? Uh, because there was an American diplomat um, uh, uh, who was uh, basically helping them plan what to do. They had this time, and he said, this is somebody that you have to hear. And it was, uh, three of the most riveting hours um, that I spent um and I'm not going to tell you any more about it. <laughs> That's why, among one of the reasons why people talk to me. Look, uh, I, 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 I was in the mil Israeli military for many years. And the classic military unit, and this is a universal all over the world, has a staff sergeant. The powerful non-commissioned officer in the unit. 
uh, the many of the troops, the, you know, the, for, for whom over whom he has sort of command, will either be discharged or move up the chain of command, and then the officers will move up the chain of command, and the staff sergeant stays where he is, and it's kind of a, it's not a very senior position. I've been a staff sergeant in the military unit of Jerusalem for the last 30 years. And every time a new diplomat will come to town initially, I will give them bar mitzvah lessons in order so that they will be able to report what's what. And I'm considered to be reliable. A bit of a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> uh, now today there are graduates of my kindergarten who are now chiefs of staff, national security advisors, no foreign ministers yet. And over time, um, a lot of people have felt that if I want to be able to get a grasp about the geopolitics of Jerusalem in a way that I'll be able to contextualize them, go to Danny. So I've been in this unit um, as staff sergeant for all these years. So I'll let you in on a secret. This is also known in the military. Very often, the staff sergeant is the most powerful person in the unit. <laughs> so there's no reason to, you know, feel sorry about my lowly, uh, you know, how, task. How many senators have you met, do you think, in your life? Uncountable. I can't count. Over 200? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, I, you know, it's not, it's, I don't think it's in the hundreds. Uh, members of Congress, definitely. Definitely wow. hundreds. Oh, wow. Um, if you could go back in a time machine to 2000, before Camp David, and you were an advisor to Ehud Barak, do you know what you would have told him? I did have a minor role. Um... And I did not know then what I know now. I I I can I can tell you one anecdote that uh, shortly before Camp David, I got a phone call from a few American diplomats. Danny, we're at the King David. Um, can you pop over? Which I did. Uh, it was the days before I had a laptop, and they didn't tell me what it was about. And they said. Uh, one of the lines I will never forget, you know, we're about to start permanent status talks in Jerusalem, and we don't know very much about it. Could you give us some bar mitzvah lessons? <laughs> uh, something that was subsequently described as the best planned summit since Yalta. The, the, the amount of information and expertise in the room at Camp David could not have told the simple. Now, there was a very fast learning curve among all. And by the way, I think the Palestinians were better prepared than both the Americans and the Israelis, but all three of them learned. I don't think um, that an agreement could have been reached. I just don't think that the parties were right at that point. Um, and it was not an accident that Camp David did not succeed. And, and Jerusalem was part of that. If there is one thing I would have done differently is I would have weighed in more forcefully than I did not to allow Sharon to go to the mouth on September 28th, 2000. I warned people, but not enough. And, you know, maybe the course of events would have been different, but um, that's, that's a regret that I have. I should have been more adamant in my warnings. If there was a internal revolution in Iran, and let's say the government became like a normal secular democracy, not the mullahs in charge, how much of the turmoil in the region would disappear within five years? You know, it's, it's how many years? Five. Since the, oh, no, how many years has it been since 
um, 79. The wall, the wall came down and the Soviet regime disappeared and we're still trying to figure out how the world works. I don't know. I, 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 I when I, when I, living in this neighborhood, it's clear that the impact of the Iranians is dangerous and um, uh, a part of is a major problem at the deepest level for Israel. But it's also a possibility that uh, uh, the Iranian, Iranian the Persian civilization is amazing. It's part of the neighborhood. Uh, and I very much regret, I mean, it, Jerusalem introduces you to civilizations. And, uh, you know, it, 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 those are the gifts that I received from Jerusalem. I would love to have uh, direct access to Iranian Persian civilization, but to speak about it geopolitically, come on, it's way, way above my, my pay grade. Mm -hmm. One thing I think you're really smart at is understanding that there can be re good value for Israel in being criticized from by America in into being held to a higher standard. Held there to any standard. Yeah, any standard. We have we have become what we've become because we've been given a pass in places that other people have not been given passes. We've not been held accountable. You know, those who love Israel, and I'm the last one to make, you know, somebody like President Biden disavow himself of his love for Israel. But when you shower uh, aid, funding, weapons on Israel without accountability, you're like a wealthy uncle who's subsidizing our addiction to the crack of settlements and occupation and send, instead of sending us off to rehab. Use the same funds and send us to rehab. The support for Israel isn't declining. It's collapsed because it's payback time. And had we been held accountable all along, we wouldn't have arrived here. Yeah, like, for instance, I wish um, Bush, like 20 years ago, they'd put sanctions on the settlements. That would have been that would have been great. Um does the sanctions on these settlers, I know it's very small right now, but does that give you any hope that there could be mechanisms to perhaps slow down the settlement and enterprise, perhaps? Yeah, this move in isolation obviously will not do that. Um, but the needle is moving. And uh, when President Biden, whose credentials as a supporter of Israel are as they are, moves the needle, everybody else's needle moves as well. Now, I, don't, I hope it does not move, as it has with some, into a vilification and demonization of Israel as such. But it does move um, gov governments that are friendly to Israel to hold us accountable, I think that will be very healthy for Israel, the Palestinians in the region. Obviously, you don't live in America. The reaction uh, in America after October 7th, um, there's been a lot of talk about anti-Semitism from afar. What is your sense on anti-Semitism in America? Anti-Semitism has always been there. It's been palpable in the extreme right. It has been latent in the extreme left. I believe I underestimated the anti-Semitism and the left. Uh, it's a discussion I feel very squeamish about participating in because anti-Semitism has been abused often as a term in order to deflect legitimate criticism of Israel. Uh, and it's turned into a nasty conversation that generates a lot of heat and very little um, light. And I have to say, I have problems with people who are sensitive to anti-Semitism. 
correctly, not those who abuse it. And uh, witness similar things being done by Israel and hold their silence. Uh, combating anti-Semitism exists. It's important. It's dangerous. But it has to be a humanistic approach to eradicating. It's not merely about Jews. You know, first they came poor. Um, but uh, it's something that has to be treated seriously. And those who are abusing it need to be discredited. My advice to Israelis would be this. And I think, hopefully, I want to see if you agree that maybe there's been a wake-up call with all the protests, with the polling numbers about how unpopular Israel is among young Americans. Um, but I would tell Israelis, do not take actions expecting there to for sure be a strong U.S. alliance in 20 years. I've been saying and, that for a long time. Yeah, and they should really know that this could be the, there's a window here. Um, and that, you know, maybe it's best to make a deal on two states while you're in this window. Has there been any kind of wake-up call in Israel about, you know, we can't take this alliance for granted? Um, there's been some of that. Uh, but not as much as one would expect for a very understandable reason. Israelis aren't going abroad. <laughs> We're not traveling, or really now tra traveling. Um, I have warned for years that if we do not engage Israel, support for Israel has collap will collapse. Support for Israel has collapsed. It's not past tense. Uh, part of it is uh, generational, um, and that me and Israelis are not aware of how serious that is. We're becoming aware when we receive warnings from our foreign ministry: uh, do not display anything associated with Israel when you walk through the streets of Paris and London. We're going to feel that, um, and. It will drive us in part to you know, a bastion mentality, but it will also mean we're going to have to sweat to maintain or regenerate support that we took for granted in the past. And that's very healthy. I think that um, uh, there is a large segment of a meaningful public opinion that says occupation cannot be allowed to continue unattended. And we had better learn that and try to take the lead on this and, con and, and to, you know, uh, not control events, but sort of influence them. Um, Israelis are becoming aware of that because of the rift between Biden and Netanyahu when we start traveling again. Uh, we're all going to know. Tell us the best books on Israel-Palestine and the people that you think know more on the subject than you. Oh, that's not fair. Uh, <laughs> um, that's not fair. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll refer to one book, um, which I believe was written in the 1970s or 80s, by the late uh, historical geographer Mehron ben Venisti, and it's called City of Fire. Uh, Mehron was one of the great experts and quintessential Jerusalemites, and he gives the best portrait that I know of contemporary Jerusalem, and if there was one book, that's the book. City of Fire by Mehron ben Venisti. Thank you so much. It, it was a really a pleasure. Thank you.